but the geography of forgiveness is an ever-flowing stream of grace and mercy and compassion. The Gospel of the Lord as it comes to us from the book of Luke, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, he stepped out on to the land, and a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time this man had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered it. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds, saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. It's kind of a joke on her part, really. Cheryl, the leader, teases the group by saying out loud the things we're all thinking, or maybe doing but don't often share on this journey of health management that we're on together. We who go to the Weight Watchers class. I thought I was the only one, of course, who chose my outfit for weigh-in day to feature the lightest fabrics, shorts if possible, Sandals I could kick off before I got on the scale. All of us who gather for weigh a day take off any extra outerwear and empty our pockets as if we were going through a TSA airport checkout. And then we gingerly step onto the scale. We watch the numbers roll back and forth and hope that the one that it ends up on is the smaller one. It passes a lot of smaller numbers before it finally settles on the one they record. I don't know why it works that way. So it turns out, we're all wearing it. We're all clothed in our Weight Watchers uniform. It binds us together as people of the class. It identifies us as companions on the road to better health, that road that we're 
making by walking and walking and walking and walking. Some people wear devices to measure their steps. And we've been told that it's good to get in 10,000 a day. Well, there's been some recent research that indicates that that number doesn't arise out of any scientific research, but it is the product of the people who make the device, or someone who just said that would be a good thing to do, 10,000 steps. So I'll have you know that yesterday, after running around the convention center, <laughs> and to and fro, mine registered 20,000 steps. <laughs> walking and walking and walking and making roads to better health or better fitness or better weight, whatever road it is that we're on. But you don't see that uniform. Passing by us on the street, you'd never know that we were wearing that uniform. Looking through the class, looking through the glass to see the class gathered in the meeting room, you'd never know that we were wearing a uniform. Now, shorts and flip-flops on a cold, rainy day may signal some people to have suspicions. We continue through Paul's letter to the Galatian congregations this morning and find Paul explaining the purpose of the law. The law here that he talks about is the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments at worst it are represented as legalistic, pre-Christian oppression, burdensome, not to be paid attention to, dismissed as obsolete. It's the domain of those who lack faith in Christ to move beyond the law. Those who can't manage with Christ, we might think, retreat to the safety of legalism. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and what not to do. Then I'm comfortable. And there would be some truth in that characterization of the law, as Paul describes it. But even Paul, even here, notes that the law did serve a purpose. Being imprisoned and guarded by it doesn't sound like fun, but in his therefore statement, Paul says that the law was our disciplinarian. Still doesn't sound much like fun. But imagine a disciplinarian to be like Maria with the children in the sound of music, teaching them to sing do re mi. You have to know the notes to sing, and then you can sing most anything. That's what the law does. Teaches us the notes. The Greek word for this disciplinarian that Paul describes is pedagogos, which is interpreted to be kind of like, with all due respect and understanding for the inappropriateness of this, it was kind of like the family slave in that day, who watches over and supervises the children. That's what the law does. But Paul is here to tell the Galatian congregations that faith in Christ makes Maria unnecessary. In Christ, he tells them, they've already become God's children through faith. And the sign of that baptism is as if they have been dressed in new clothes, dressed in Christ. Christ is now the suit they're wearing. I would never have thought it before this, but it could be that a striking baptismal imagery of all things is Maria in the sound of music, who eyes the heavy drapes that are keeping the light out of the house, tears them down, and clothes the children in those drapes so that they can go out and play. So that they can be children, so that they can be free. She clothes them in those drapes, so they can be who they're really intended to be. This clothing which with, with which we're clothed in Christ renders the divisive distinctions pointless. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female even. 
Instead, there is oneness in Christ. And then Paul, in the shocking conclusion, coming from his own Hebrew roots, says, if they belong to Christ, they are Abraham's offspring. You want to be children of Abraham? Be clothed in Christ, and you will be children of Abraham. But it's clothing that most people don't see most of the time. When we walk out this door and get in our cars and stop at the nursery or the restaurant or the Home Depot or the grocery store, people won't see that we're wearing that clothing. People won't notice it. But we are all of the time. When Jesus encountered this man with the demons, he was in foreign territory. He crossed the lines when he got in that boat and went across the water where he found a man who needed washing. This man had worn no clothes for a long time. And he lived among the tombs, among the dead, instead of among the living in a house. And he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles for his own good. Maybe a little bit like the law does. For his own good, he was bound so he wouldn't breach the boundaries. It was perhaps for him some kind of salvation up to that point. But when Jesus met him, Jesus told him a different story. Jesus recognized God's presence in this man, so wounded, so naked, so dirty, so screaming, so out of control. And Jesus told him a different story. A different story than the one he was hearing from the people in that town. A different story from the one that that man was telling himself. A different story even than the ones that the demons were saying. Jesus told this man the story of who he really was. And he gave him back himself. And the next time we see him, he's clothed. He's clothed in Christ. We all share a road on life's pilgrimage. We're all heading somewhere. We may be like Elijah on the run after difficult times. And the difficult times may have been yesterday. It may have been last week. They may have been 20 years ago. They may have been as we were a child growing up. And we're on the run because things have not gone right. People may not see it. We may not always even be aware of it ourselves. But like Elijah, Sometimes we're on the run. And we encounter all kinds of big things, and yet often what reminds us of who we are is that still, small voice that comes bubbling up within us and reminds us of who we really are, what the story really is, who God really calls us to be. And God invites us back to who we really are. In fact, maybe sometimes God says, like God did to Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here mired in your old story? What are you doing here with these demons in you? Let me tell you a different story. I am your God, and I love you. We're all somewhere on life's pilgrimage. We're all trying to fix something. We're all trying to get to a place that we've not been before. We're all trying to deal with something that we don't like about where we've come from. And increasingly on the way in these days, there is no clearly marked road. The way, rather, is made as we walk it. As we put one foot in front of the other in the way that God is leading, we begin to remember who we are. We begin to be able to see the road. The law provides some boundaries and markers along the way that can be helpful. Like those long poles that stick out of deep snow to remind us where the road would be if we could get down to it. 
but we're left to make a fresh track. It may be where that old road is, it may go a different direction. We're invited to make a fresh track. We can do that not because the law corrals us and tells us where to go, but because of the Christ who walks with us on that road. And we can do it because we're not naked anymore. We are clothed with Christ. That's true whether you can see it or not. That's true whether or not we always remember it. The general assembly convened yesterday and in some of the opening comments we were reminded of the challenges facing the church today not just our presbyterian church but the church around the world and we were invited to consider the possibility that god is doing a new thing in our church and in the church you may not be able to see it you may not look through the glass at those who are gathered and be able to identify them for who they are for who we are and yet we are clothed with Christ, and there is something new happening. You can see it in the expectant faces of those who gather. You can see it in the encouraging words shared by people in the hallways and in breakfasts and seminars and lunches that go on all week. You can see it in worship, and you can see it in the business. The first, one of the first items of business yesterday was to uh, elect new moderators. And we elected for the first time co-moderators. Never been done before. This is the 222nd General Assembly. Never been done before. We elected two co-moderators, both women, one African American. Maybe it's a new day in the church. Maybe we're making a new road. Maybe we're being clothed in a new set of clothes. So whether you are an individual, whether it's our General Assembly, whether it's this congregation, we're on a road and Jesus is clothing us with a new identity. And that's what we live into in these days to which Christ calls us. 